we have to focus on the process and uh, winning on a daily basis. So we're just focused on taking one day at a time and uh, one week at a time. And I think uh, since Mickey Joseph has taken over, he's done a good job of just uh, allowing us to focus on the task at hand and not get too ahead of ourselves. So before we could talk about, you know, any end of the season awards and accolades and goals, we're just trying to take one day at a time. But it's good for us as a team and as a program to get two wins under our belt, and we're looking to uh, continue that win streak. That was Nebraska quarterback Casey Thompson talking about the Huskers' week-by-week approach to this 2022 season. Normally, that stuff is pretty easy to dismiss as just your standard coach speak. Somewhere, probably every press conference in the country this week, someone's saying something similar. But this Nebraska season isn't normal. We know Nebraska has a few strengths, some glaring flaws, and a whole mess of complications given all the change thrown on top of that. I wrote this after last week's win over Rutgers, but normally a one-point win over the Scarlet Knights would be a catastrophe in Lincoln. Now, only the result matters. There's no long-term concerns with any result because Nebraska football gets a truly fresh start at the end of the year. There's a freedom here that normally doesn't exist at a program with the history of success that Nebraska has had. So, you got outplayed by Rutgers, but found a way to win. Great. It marked the first consecutive conference wins for Nebraska since 2018. Beat Purdue this week in West Lafayette. And the Huskers will have won three straight games for the first time since starting the 2016 season 7-0. The Boilermakers are on their own little run. Should Purdue win... It will be the first four-game win streak since 2018. The Boilermakers started shockingly bad that year, losing to Northwestern, Eastern Michigan, and Missouri to open the season. Then they ripped off four straight, including that shocking 49-20 win over Ohio State and West Lafayette. The streak stakes are high in this one. And, on top of that, whoever wins is guaranteed to keep a share of first place in the West for another week. That was easy to foresee after Nebraska lost to Northwestern and Ireland, right? We all thought then that, should the Huskers beat Purdue, they'll go into their second bye week tied for first in the division. Of course we did. Weird year. Still a chance to be a fun year for Nebraska. Purdue, too. You're listening to the I-80 Preview, Huskers Boilermakers Edition. I'm Hale Varsity Managing Editor Brandon Vogel. Let's talk some football. Let's jump into the first week, uh, or first half of this week's show, rather, by looking back at last week's keys to the Rutgers game. Key number one for me was throw fewer than two interceptions. More specifically, I said Nebraska could maybe survive throwing two, but it might make things pretty uncomfortable. Even more specifically, I thought if those interceptions came in the first half, it might be real trouble. And it was. Casey Thompson, going into that game, hadn't thrown any interceptions in the first half. He'd been great in the first half, not so much in the second. Last week, it flipped. I suppose you could say with this key, all of those things kind of came true. Nebraska put itself in a 13-0 hole. It wasn't comfortable. They were in trouble. The Huskers didn't stay under the number, but found a way to win anyway. So I guess you call this key a push, maybe? Key number two was to kill the big plays. This was not an explosive Rutgers offense entering last week. Even so, the Knights hit for an explosive play on 19.5% of all snaps in the first half. Things were going much to Rutgers' liking. Nebraska turned it around in the second half, allowing an explosive play rate of 11% and pitching a shutout. So for the game, they ended up about average, a little below average against Rutgers in this category. Got the win, though, so we'll call this a push. Or maybe we're just realizing my keys were a little bit off last week. That's always uh, certainly possible, although hopefully not inevitable. Key number three, get to 31 points. Not even close. That specific number wasn't chosen at random. See last week's show if you missed why and want to know why. I think that number is important in the Big Ten. But a solid Rutgers defense made what I thought was a pretty strong Nebraska offense look pretty shaky. This Purdue defense is similar in some ways, but better. Let's go that direction. Circus Sports opened this game at Purdue minus 11 on Sunday afternoon. 
By midweek, it was up to around minus 13 and a half in favor of the Boilermakers. ESPN's SP Plus power ratings have Nebraska at 67th this week, down four spots from last week, and Purdue's up to 21st. The ratings there project a line of Purdue minus 14.7. FPI, ESPN's other primary power rating, also dropped the Huskers a couple of spots, from 74th to 76th, while the Boilermakers are 22nd there. The FPI line comes in at minus 14.1 have to say, I was not buying some of the off-season hype for Purdue. The Boilermakers lost their DC, lost two top receivers, and lost some key, key defenders. But the, here they are, top 25 in both of these power ratings, and the lack of drop-off on defense is particularly impressive. Who are the key players for the Boilermakers this week? Start with Cam Allen, safety. His three interceptions are tied for eighth nationally and first in the Big Ten. He ranks second on the team in tackles with 24, while fellow safety Sadducee Kane leads the team. Got a pair of pretty good safeties there at Purdue. Second key player, kind of tough to uh, tough to choose anyone else, but wide receiver Car- Charlie Jones he transferred from Buffalo to Iowa in 2020. Uh, He made his biggest splash as a returner with the Hawkeyes. In this offense, however, Jones Jones finally gets to be a receiver. He has 50 catches for 603 yards and seven touchdowns so far. His old team, Iowa, has thrown two touchdowns total on the year. So I have to imagine he's enjoying this. I would be. Number three, we could, of course, go with quarterback Aiden O'Connell, but I'm going to assume you're well aware that he's a key to everything that Purdue does. So instead, we'll uh, stick in the backfield but go elsewhere. Running back Devin Mockaby, the walk-on has emerged as Purdue's leading rusher following an injured injury to backfield fixture King Daru. Seriously, I feel like Purdue's had three running backs since Nebraska joined the Big Ten in 2011, and each of them has somehow played six seasons. Anyway, Mockaby. He has 275 yards rushing and is averaging 5.5 per carry. This is still a pass-heavy Purdue offense, but the Boilermakers' run game has 11 touchdowns on the year. It's already the most in the season since 2018, and its rushing success rate is 35th nationally. We'll flip this to the Nebraska side. Stick with running back. Anthony Grant is my first key for the Huskers, key player for the Huskers of the week. First three games for him in a Nebraska uniform, 69 carries, 428 yards, 6.2 yards per rush. Last three games, similar number of carries, 64, but only 219 yards, a 3.4 yards per carry average. Of course, I don't think this is Grant's fault, but this Purdue run defense is strikingly strong. Eighth in success rate and allowing an explosive run on just 6% of carries. How does Nebraska get Grant some opportunities? It's kind of the key question for me going into this week because he is clearly one of Nebraska's best players on offense. And as we're seeing, he can't do everything himself in the run game. Needs a little bit of help. Second key player for me will go a little bit off the beaten path, maybe, although maybe not. We'll see. Uh, Cornerback Brandon Moore. The transfer came up with a big interception last week, and Nebraska might need him to play like the veteran he is again this week. Cornerback Quentin Newsom, who missed the Rutgers game, was day-to-day per Mickey Joseph midweek, and teams will try to pick on true freshman Malcolm Hartzog like Rutgers did. Moore had to step in for Hartzog a little bit, just to help him get his legs under him after. The Scarlet Knights chose to pick on him and hit for a couple of big passing plays in that first half. He's got to be key here again, no matter what the mixture of snaps at cornerback looks like, uh, because, well, it's just going to be a big week for Nebraska's secondary in general. More on that in the second half. It's also going to be, I think, a big opportunity for Moore, a chance to see more and more if you will, because of key player number three, Tommy Hill, who used to be a cornerback, but is now a wide receiver. It's part of the reason that position's a little pressing right now. Hill moved to offense last week. Uh, <clears throat> wide receiver Isaiah Garcia Castaneda announced he was transferring this week. 
So Hill's over with that group now. Can he have an impact? This is kind of a wild card pick. Joseph said he's too talented to keep off the field. Interesting. And Thompson said they've already built a good connection on deep balls in practice. Intriguing. We'll see, I guess. That will take us to halftime. Here's meteorologist Rusty Dawkins with the forecast for Saturday. You can follow Rusty on Twitter at Husker Weather and check HaleVarsity.com throughout the week for updates ahead of game day. Hi, everybody. I'm meteorologist Rusty Dawkins for Hale Varsity. This is the I-80 preview podcast forecast. And what a forecast. This, uh, this is one of those games. It's that time of year. Leaves are changing. Fall is in the air. That's exactly what you're going to get in West Lafayette for this game on Saturday. It is a, an evening kickoff. So you're, if you're out there early, uh, enjoy. It is going to be one of those fall kind of days that you can just get outside, maybe a hoodie and some jeans and maybe a light jacket in the morning and in, into the evening, but overall really looking like a nice, nice fall day in Indiana. So here's your forecast. If you're out and about in the morning, tailgating or, or anything uh, out there, we'll see temperatures uh, pretty close to the lower 50s, a small chance for rain in the morning. That's about the only fly in the ointment here. Just a few sprinkles lingering in the morning hours, otherwise mostly cloudy skies a southwest wind at 10 to 20 miles per hour. We dry out as we head into the afternoon hours, I think by noon, partly to mostly cloudy skies. Temperatures in the upper 50s with a southwest wind at 5 to 15 miles per hour. And by the middle of the afternoon, still looking at partly to mostly cloudy skies. Temperatures top out right around 60 degrees. Great fall weather out there. Southwest wind, 5 to 15 miles per hour. Then as we head towards the game, kickoff, 6.30. Looking at mostly to partly cloudy skies. Temperatures in the upper 50s. A little bit of a west wind at 5 to 15 miles per hour. By halftime, still partly cloudy. Lower 50s starting to cool off. A nice little chill in the air. A little bit of a northwest breeze at 5 to 10 miles per hour. And by the end of the game, maybe a little a little cool. Partly cloudy skies, temperatures in the upper 40s with a northwest wind at 5 to 10 miles per hour. So if there are any updates to this, uh, you can follow all of my social media pages. That's Husker Weather on Facebook and Twitter. Also my personal one, Rusty WX. That's, uh, that's all Nebraska all the time. And of course, all of the Hale Varsity channels and their website. Go Big Red. We'll get the second half underway here with a look at Purdue in a nutshell. It's 4-2, and two, which includes a four-point loss to Penn State. That was a total coin flip in week one. Then the Boilermakers smoke Indiana State in week two, lose to Syracuse by three while having a 72% postgame win probability, beat Florida Atlantic by two while having a 31% postgame win probability. It was a weird way to get to two and two, but two and two was probably earned. Since then, however, the Boilermakers have a pair of impressive Big Ten wins at Minnesota and at Maryland. This team might be rounding into form. So how do the Huskers beat Purdue? Here are three keys I'll be keeping a close eye on on Saturday. Number one, let it fly. Sure, the easiest way for Nebraska to come out of West Lafayette with a win is to find a way, some way, to run the football. But things aren't trending in that direction. Against Power 5 opponents this year, Nebraska's averaging less than three yards per carry. Purdue has been nasty against the run allowing just 11 rushes of 10-plus yards so far, third nationally, and with a top-10 success rate on the ground. The Huskers might have to go over that front seven, and that's not easy either, though it's the comparative path of least resistance. Purdue ranks 37th in success rate against the pass, gives up an average rate of explosive passes, 15.1%, and is high havoc rate at 22%. That's 17th nationally. The Boilermakers' eight interceptions are tied for 14th nationally. The 36 total passes defended, so interceptions plus pass breakups, is tied for sixth in the country. So is Nebraska, incidentally. Again, this is not a leaky pass defense. The key for the Nebraska pass game is probably twofold. A, you got to avoid the picks. Penn State threw one, Syracuse none in their wins over Purdue. B, you got to hit big. More important than completion percentage or yards per attempt here is probably yards per completion. Penn State was at 14. Syracuse, 13.9. Minnesota was at 14.3, which probably should have been good enough, but Tanner Morgan uncharacteristically threw three interceptions, and Purdue 
won a classic Big Ten game, which I did not see coming at all, uh, 20 to 10 over the Gophers in Minneapolis. At 12.3 yards per completion on the year, Nebraska is slightly above the national average. Its 18.7 explosive pass percentage is above average too. This is an offense we've seen can, can gain yards and chunks through the air. Of course, Thompson needs time to let some of those deep shots develop. Nebraska might catch a slight break here. Purdue's defense, as good as it is elsewhere, only ranks 96th in sack rate at 4.44%. Nebraska's offense is 82nd, which I think we all probably assumed, having watched all these games, allowing a sack on 7.07% of dropbacks. Things might look a little better for Nebraska than it has recently, however, because that Purdue sack rate is in fact lower than the last two teams Nebraska has played. I wouldn't take it as a given that the Huskers are going to show up on Saturday and all of a sudden it's going to feel like Casey Thompson is as clean as he's been in the pocket for, for weeks, but you got a slightly better shot maybe than you did in the past two. On the year, back to the yards per completion key here, on the year, Purdue's allowing 13 yards per completion. Nebraska will probably have to be better than that, which would be above its own season average. Let's call it 13.5 if, emphasis on if, Nebraska keeps it to one interception or less. So pretty, they're high bars, I would say, to hit for this Nebraska passing offense, but not out of the realm of possibility. So if Nebraska's passing game comes out and looks good, looks strong, which it has shown at times this season, it probably looks like that. Avoiding avoiding interceptions, again, I'll, I'll grant you maybe one, um, and hitting for some big plays, which is going to bring that yards per completion number up. Key number two, be comfortable being lonely on defense. To hold up against this Purdue offense, a defense has to tackle well. It's non-negotiable. It's the thing the boilers make, Boilermakers make you prove you can do. We know Purdue likes to throw the ball, but it's how that's a particular challenge. The Boilermakers rank 11th in pass attempts per game, 42.8, but just 80th in yards per attempt. They'll go horizontal. They'll go short, plenty to fill in gaps for a fairly pedestrian run game. That's been the case at Purdue for a while now though this run game this year might be as strong as we've seen from the Boilermakers in a while. The result of such a horizontal and vertical pass threat, not to mention trick plays, which Brom seems to have all of them from fleet flickers to running back and wide receiver passes, all of the reverses you could want, keep all of those in mind too. But the result of such a horizontal and vertical passing threat is that 71% of tackles made against Purdue this year have been solo tackles. That's higher than any team in the West other than Northwestern, which is basically trying to run a similar sort of offense with much less success at the moment. The Wildcats actually rank seventh in country in pass attempts per game and are all the way down at 105th in yards per attempt. So that's how that's going. But it's an approach that sticks out in the Big Ten, and Nebraska's back seven needs to have a precise day. The best way to measure how well Nebraska is tackling is probably just yards per play. Purdue comes into Saturday averaging 5.7. Nebraska's defense is allowing 5.9. Though it, it has only allowed 4.3 to Indiana and 5.1 to Rutgers the past two weeks. That said, this Purdue offense is better than either of the last two Nebraska faced. Defensively, I think Nebraska would take a stalemate here. It probably needs to keep Purdue in the 5.4 to 5.7 yards per play range to give itself a shot. Easier said than done, though Purdue's last three opponents, which includes Florida Atlantic, have done it. So key number two, that's the, that's the number to hit as a way to measure how well Nebraska is or isn't tackling. Probably got to keep this around 5.5, 5.6 yards per play overall for this Purdue offense. Key number three, the land of opportunity. You can probably count on both teams to be pretty good in the red zone on Saturday. Purdue ranks sixth nationally in red zone conversion percentage, scoring on 24 or 25 trips this year, 
That's 96%. Nebraska is only 63rd at 83.3%. But the Boilermakers and Huskers rank 4th and 5th nationally in touchdown percentage in the red zone at 84 and 83.3% respectively. Yes, that means Nebraska has yet to kick a field goal on 18 red zone attempts. The big difference between the two teams is the frequency. Purdue is averaging 4.2 red zone trips per game. It was the difference last week at Maryland. The Terps rank one spot ahead of Purdue nationally, so third in in touchdown percentage in the red zone. But the Boilermakers got five red zone trips to Maryland's three. Both teams got points every trip. Nebraska has been good at finishing in the red zone with TDs, but it's only averaging three trips inside the 20 per game. Nebraska probably has to at least equal Purdue on Saturday, unless it plans to score from distance on defense or on special teams. The Huskers might be able to get a couple from 20-plus yards out. But the lingering shock for me from that Rutgers game is that Nebraska only had four drives cross the Knights' 40-yard line. It only had one red zone attempt. Remember, I was thinking Nebraska had a great shot to score 30-plus in that game. Barring some non-offensive scores in West Lafayette, Neither of those numbers is going to be enough on Saturday. Huskers probably have to be above their season average of three red zone trips per game, but let's just say Nebraska needs to be even with Purdue when it comes to opportunities. That covers us both ways. Whether Saturday turns into a slog, unlikely, or a shootout, somewhat more likely. That'll do it for the show this week. Thanks as always for listening to the IED preview. If you like the show, do your podcast chores, rate, review, tell a friend. But the best way to support the show and everything we do at Hale Varsity is becoming a subscriber. Visit hailvarsity.com slash subscribe to sign up for access to everything we do, including 11 monthly issues of the magazine, and use promo code IED at checkout for a discount.